Hey guys, it's me again. I cannot believe I had to do this all over again. Yeah, the whole thing stopped working on me the last time. I'm sorry that I didn't that I didn't bring in anything. So, uh, anyways, anyways, I'll I'll try to redo. I'll do I'll redo part four today and hopefully release it. I'll probably even might have to do part part five after this. So well, there we are. I have to do all this crap again, so it is part four of Trudy's Garden. Shirley had trouble focusing as she ponderously walked toward the backstage area. Echo of her quote-unquote session with the with the two fillies still bounced around her head as she reveled in them. The start of the set should have been everything she had hoped for, but the middle part left much to be desired. The ending, however, had made up made up for all of that. And how. She decided not... She, she didn't know where they... Found the energy or the willpower, but those last screams, the thrashing of their bodies as their flesh melted away, it had all just been so exhilarating. Shirley trembled and shook, just remembering, just remembering it. She attempt, she attempted to walk in a straight line, but she just couldn't quite pull it off. Analyzing her own feelings, feelings, she realized the sensations rushing through her body weren't unlike those she felt during one of. One of the many sexual escapades she took in part in her per, part during her wilder years. A little voice at the back back of her conscious mind said she ought to be disturbed by this notion, but the dominant part of her psyche was adamant that it was that it was completely normal. After all, those fillies had done unto her a great injustice, and she was doing the entire the entire community a favor by removing their toxic influence from the world. It was natural to feel good about a job well done. It took it took the mayor a few minutes, a few moments to realize she stopped walking and has now leaned heavily, leaning heavily against a nearby stage wall as she as she pant, panted, drops of sweat running down her body. Taking a deep breath, she finally regained her composure. Taking take taken off to. Around the last corner, separating her from her destination. Almost at once, she spotted the only pony pony working in the backstage area. Snails. The aqua aqua marine maned colt with the golden coat is oblivious to her presence, preoccupied as as he was by the by the task of untangling several ropes from a knot. See him see him there gave cheerily mixed feelings about it all. On one hand, he was probably one of the, the least disruptive peoples in her class. Sure, he was another moron, but at least he had the decency not to interrupt her constantly. But on the other hand, his blatant lack of intelligence gave him an innocent demeanor, demeanor that Shirley would love to break. But the play could only be so long, and there simply wasn't, wasn't always enough, enough time for her to do the other things she really wanted to do. But the size, she shook her she shook her head, resigning herself to her original plans for him. It'd be over far too fast for her taste, but at least she had found some way to some way of connecting connecting him to the events of the play, even back here. Oh snails she called out sweetly. I think I think it's time for you to get into position. He looked around in confusion. Oh hey, Miss Truly," he said dorkily. "Uh, the ropes got stuck, and I, and I was just." He began, only to be cut off by Truly as he started pushing him gently in the direct direction opposite to the one she come from. Now, now, snails, I know, I know full well what I told you. After the break, you need to hold the rope on the X," she she said slowly, pronunciating the extra word carefully. The rope on the X. Snail, snails echoed. Just a few meters ahead, some pony had indeed chalked, chalked a big white X on the on the stage floor, and a long, sturdy rope hung down from the ceiling right above it. 
Snails went to stand on the mark without any hesitation and took. It took the rope of the and the end of the rope between his teeth. Shirley nodded ap approvingly at him, and his chest swelled up with pride. It almost made Shirley feel bad. Almost, but not quite. She put her ear against a thick wall separating the stage from the backstage area, trying trying to listen in on the on the scene. She could barely make out two ponies talking to each other, and even though she couldn't understand what they were saying, it did give her a rough idea of the current si situation on stage. <laughs> for the umpteenth time, she had to chastise herself for drawing out, drawing out her fun too long and reveling in the, in the aftermath of it, as she realized she only got there in the nick of time. If she kept that up, she'd mess up sooner. Sooner or later, and she knew it. She made a mental note to adhere to her schedule more rigorously from from there on out. Comforted by the fact that she got almost half halfway through the show without any major incidents, she closed her eyes as she listened to the sounds reaching reaching her reaching her through the wall. Her imagination created the the scene inside her head. She saw Sweetie Belle and Apple Bloom quarrel about. What they should do next. She saw the king shoot down every single I idea her last remaining night came up with, and, sh and she saw her finally fulminating, fulminating that enough is enough. That she that she needed a good night's rest to mull it, mull it all over. She witnessed the king the king curse the sun for for still being so high in the sky. Felt her felt her reach for a rope that disappeared somewhere in the. In the darkness above the stage, watched her pull it down with her, with all of her might. Then the sun fell from the sky. As it descended, the technician pony in the box, box above the tribunes, doused most of the lights. While the orchestra started playing loudly, the king's lament has begun. Julie's eyes flew open as, as soon as she heard the first notes, her gay, her gaze shooting up instantly. The world seemed to slow down to a crawl as the school teacher saw a huge spotlight, the sun, come crashing down from the ceiling, exactly above the e the eggs she had planted. Snails snails had spotted spotted it as well, as he tugged on the rope rope in his mouth desperately, wondering why it didn't work that time. Why why it didn't why it didn't it allow allow him to gently let the the spotlight down like it had before? His only conscious thought concerning not letting not letting his teacher and every pony else down during those crucial moments. And so he kept on trying the rope, but it wouldn't it wouldn't budge, and the and the spotlight did not slow down. Moments before impact, both Chili and Snails lowered their lowered their gaze, gaze and looked 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 each other in the eye. Chili mouthed the word goodbye and broke and broke into a smile. But the actual word itself was lost into a rush of the music. <laughs> Snails stared in confusion. Why? Why is she smiling? Why is she just standing there? Why is she? <laughs> the spotlight crashed down onto the cult. Small pieces of glass shattering over, over the floor and flying, flying off into the air as the music hit a crescendo. The the cheerly it looked looked like a slow motion uh, explosion of tiny shiny crystals erupted around the younger pony, temporarily hiding him hiding him from her eyes. The combination of the or orchestral orchestral music and the sudden cloud of tiny glass splinters was simply too much for Cheerly's romantic soul to bear, and she shed a single tear of, at the beauty of it all. <laughs> the world finally kicked back to its usual gear as the tiny Tiny pieces of glass clattered, clattered onto the floor, and the and the orchestra stopped playing. Finally, she could admire the fruits of her labor in the form of snails, snails broken body, lying underneath underneath the huge spotlight. Most of it having been crushed, crushed from the middle down. Even his upper torso had hundreds of tiny cuts and lacerations all over it. Although he didn't get directly hit from the falling object there, his normally go golden coat was soaked, soaked red in many places. 
Chili took a few steps forward to admire the, the way a small, a small pool of blood flowed between the many fragments of glass on the floor. The wannabe crystals crunching, crunching noisily under her hooves. As she got closer to the spotlight, she started noticing this, the smell of burnt flesh impregnating the air. And it seemed to get warmer with every step she took as well. She walked around on the other side of the spotlight and finally realized why. Shirley had known that spotlights get very hot, of course, but she didn't expect the thing to retain the heat quite, a, quite that long. S Snail's entire, entire backside was covered in blisters, singed flesh, and smoldering fur as she noticed it was still spreading. With a high-pitched hissing sound, a patch of fur on Snail's back is suddenly ignited, the small flame dancing, dancing around playfully on the pony's back. Julie looked at it with fascination, but did not dare to get any closer. She was already uncomfortable, uncomfortably warm where she was standing, a meter or two away. The teaching pony gasped in shock as Snail's groaned and slowly opened an eye. Looking around shakily, clear, clearly still dazed. Miss Cheerily, I, uh, I can't feel my legs. What smells? Uh, he said as he craned his neck around to look over his shoulder. He immediately saw the small but growing flame as he went. And he was even, he was even smart enough to link it to the, to the horde smell. I think it uh, was assailing his nostrils. Fire! Fire! Miss Cheerly! Fire! He, he yelled. He yelled as he tried to crawl away, thrashing his upper body around wildly in an effort to get loose. Because he was trapped underneath the spotlight and with and with his hind legs out in order, the situation was hopeless from the outset. All he did was erratic movements and all he, all he did with his erratic movements was fan the flames even more. And in a matter of seconds, various various little flames were dancing around his body, as he screamed as as their hot tongues licked his tender flesh. More blisters and boils appeared appeared around the flames as they consumed every everything within reach. The fire grew and grew, more pulling more and more of his body into its deadly embrace, eager to to feast now that it, that it had been set loose upon him. Yeah! The golden pony cried out as the as the ember tentacles quick, quickly spread over to his face. His vision immediately taken up taken up almost entirely by the voracious flames. The pain was excruciating, as if thousands of little critters were were gnawing on him with hungry teeth and all all water is being drawn from his from his body at the same time. Shirley wanted watched in watching all of the spectacle before unfolded before her eyes. She hadn't expected a show at this stage at this stage of her of her plan, but there but there it was and it was breathtaking. She noted how several flames are already burning out, leaving his body charred black. Cracks and fissures appeared appeared on his dried out flesh as snail sensibly thrashed out. He started hitting himself in the face with with his hoof hooves, trying his best to put, put out the flames. Flames burning there. Every hit left death, deep imprints on his weakened boiling boiling meat, but the flames flames would not would not be conquered. At most, they re they retreated for a single second, only to come back with a vengeance. Snail screamed in agony once again and panted with 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 the effort effort as as his life flashed before his eyes. Loss of blood competing with the fire to see which one which one of them could kill him first. In the end, the fire won out as superheated air invaded the colt's lungs, singeing singeing him on the inside as his scream stopped. He we he weaved for air. Every breath felt every breath every breath felt like a thousand daggers forced down his throat. His vision started to get blurry and dark spots dark spots sprung up everywhere. Suddenly, by chance, the flame. The flames move away for a minute, and he could barely make out. Cheerily, just standing there, watching, and she was laughing. The colt let out a dry, rasping sound as the flames flew back into his face. His eyesight given out as 
as the orange tongues dug in. If he, if he, if he had had any strength left, he might have screamed the moment his eyes, his eyes popped and melted away. Flames immediately, immediately claiming his now empty eye sockets for themselves and licking the inside of his skull, but he was already far too gone. Shirley coughed and sneezed a few times. The smell had gotten too much, too much even, even for her taste. But she continued watching as the lifeless husk, formerly known as snails, burned out. A little voice at the back of her head asked her if she ought, she ought to find some water, and in case anything else caught on fire. But she was too mesmerized by the flames to care at this point. She finally snapped out of her fascination when she, when the last of the flames died, only. Leave it up black and floor roughly reminiscent of a pony in its wake. Panic hit her like a truck when she realized what she had just done. She drifted from her schedule mere moments after she promised herself not to do do just that. She mentally hit herself over the head as she racked her brain trying to remember where she was supposed to have gone instead of staring at the pretty fire. And the answer calmed, calmed her down quite a bit. She only, she'd only have to skip leaving Snip's costume for the final scene, which was different from the one she'd been wearing so far. In the in the right place for him, she shrugged. She could she could probably find it himself for that one time. He knew where, he knew where she kept it. It wouldn't be a problem. She laughed so softly as she as she went down down some stairs to get beneath the stage, the stage and then headed for the prompt the prompt's corner. For a mom for a moment there she she thought she she'd really mess up. But there but there were only three left to go now, and she was and she was still firmly in control. Nothing nothing would go wrong tonight. Nothing at all. Shirley settled into the props corner for the third time that night. Her stomach rumbled and her, and her throat was dry. In hindsight, she probably she should have probably put some popcorn and water there, but it was far too late for that. With the sudden, she turned her attention to the stage and just let her mind wander to the rhythm of the story for a while. No, my decision is final. You will you will have to go. The king screamed at Sir Altruus, who had returned to his indigenous glances with worried looks. But my king, the royal guard, they are needed to defend the capital. With tensions rising rising in the east, we have no ponies to spare. You know the you know this, I'll trust. I'll, I'll trust in your capabilities. You will not fail me like the others have. Or if you do, I'll have to accept this Cretan's challenge myself. The king sighed, the weight of the situation suddenly pressing upon heavily his upon his shoulders. Altruus, seeing the king's troubles etched on his face, fell silent and simply nodded. Without a further word, the, the king turf, turned around and walked away, leaving the confines of the royal court and head down, head down to Reginald's part of the stage. The two fillies played their, played their part as well. It was easy to forget that they were playing at all, even for a cheer. Applebaum had, had shown an almost single-minded dedication to the script, and knowing, and knowing it as Thoroughly as she did, obviously allowed her to concentrate on other aspects of acting. The words came on their own. Sweetie Belle had been a, a, le a bit less diligent, but she possess possessed a way with words and vocalization that made her a natural actor. Although Cheerley ventured to guess that singing, would, singing was probably more her style. It was somewhat ironic that they both find their end doing something they were at least moderately competent at. Well, they were otherwise pretty much a waste of space, but Shirley was careful not to equate a single, a single useful skill to be, being a worthwhile individual. The play had fallen into a similar pattern by that point, Sir Altruist being the third attempt to fun, finally put a stop to Reginald to slide. Sweetie Belle led the other three before her, started, started to make her way, make her way to the other side of the other side of the stage. 
Although she clearly wasn't aiming to get to the mountain Scootaloo had disappeared into, or the house the other two fillies had found. Instead, she resolutely headed for a forest at the far end of the stage. That is to say, to a few cardboard trees that together gave, gave the impression of a forest. She quickly reached, reached her destination as, and as the lights above that part of the stage were turned on, it became clear that some pony was already waiting for Sir Altruist there. The audience wasn't very surprised when it came clear that it was Reginald once again. But the bear trapped around one of his back legs, which he couldn't seem to get out of, was certainly an unforeseen twist. The night approached carefully, but Reginald inevitably picked up on the on his hoof steps long before before too long and craned and craned his neck to to look around. Well well seems at least one of us is lucky today. The great night arriving during the villain's finest hour. You must be thrilled. He said bitterly once in silently. Hold on. TV in my room. Yeah, sorry about that. My my friend Parker is here again. Alchua said nothing for a few moments. Are you hurt? He finally asked. The villainous pony laughed and shook his head, his voice dripping with sarcasm. Oh no, the thing is very comfortable in fact. Oh, I'll, I'll get you out, the the knight responded as he stepped forward. But if you make one strange move He never he never got to finish the sentence as so, so, suddenly something caught around his hind legs and the world flipped upside down. Before the knight realized what was happening, he was hanging down from the ceiling by his hooves. To the audience, however, it appeared as if he was hanging from one of the cardboard trees. Hey, let me down! Reginald cackled maniacally as he, as he opened the clamp around his leg, revealing it to be an impressive fake, but nothing more than that. He casually strolled over to the, to the captured knight and mockingly gave him a little push, making Sweetie Belle swing around slightly. Ah, oh, dear Sir Altruist, is it not? The one, the one for soaking about, are we? If you'd have to be quite not good, quite good not to be spotted by me. Anyway, the, and and the legendary kindness. If, who knew? Who knew it could? Who knew it get you in, in, in the in the position you are you are now? He laughed again, giving the knight another push to, to keep him swinging. If you know what's good for you, Reginald, do come with me. The king is fed up, and whatever his next move may be, he'll probably not like like it if you stick around here. Altruist replied, holding on to as much dignity as he could while upside down and swinging around. I've heard the same tale spun twice before, good stallion. I'm, qu I'm quite sick of it by now, so if you don't mind, this be this will be goodbye. Say hello to the beasts of the underworld for me. The slice sneered as he pulled off, pulled one of the omnipresent hidden levers. One of one that had been concealed behind the tree. The floor opened the rope. The rope was released all at once, sending the filly screaming down an open an open hatch to the floor. As the as the lights faded and Reginald disappeared off scene. Sweetie Belle saw 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 the floor approach rapidly and panic. The panic coiled around her like a snake. Weren't there supposed to be a few mattresses here? With a slight, with a slight, with a thud, she hit the ground. As she, as she laid there motionlessly, she didn't, she didn't have, have to think about anything for a while. Ooh, this is where the, this is where one of the death scenes come in. Hmm. I think you would like it. I think you would like it for, for, for its creativity. I guess. 
Ooh, this is an episode of CSI that I've seen already. When she came to the... When she came to... She, she was in a dimly lit room, lying, lying on the table of some, of some description. She felt the nasty bump on her head throb painfully to the rhythm of her heartbeat. But, she, but when she tried to touch it with one of her hooves, she realized her front legs were tied above her tied above her head with rope, while her hind legs were, were bound on the other side. The ropes were keeping her stretched out as much as possible, and it was more than not a little uncomfortable. It also felt as if the table had a large hole in it, right underneath the middle of her back, but she, but she couldn't for the life of her figure out why. The, her first thought was that she, she had probably hit her head harder than she, than she thought and that this was all hallucination or some sort of dream. But if it was, it was, a, it was a mighty convincing one at that. She tried looking around the room, but as there were only, only one single weak lamp right, right above her, she couldn't see much. Suddenly, she, imag she imagined seeing something move in the shadows, a shape that broke the monotony of the mo a mobile shadows with a, with a deeper kind of darkness. Is some pony there? The foolish said shakenly. Applebaum and Scootaloo had told her one of the few scary stories during their camping trips, and even un and an unnerving amount of them started off just like this. Okay, who is this one about? Uh, this is where this is where Cheerilee starts killing a bunch of a bunch of Phillies because she got because she gets pissed off at them for not for not even trying to you know learn. <laughs> yeah. Talk about teacher's incentive. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much the story's like straight up saw shit. Okay. As, as you'll hear in this. She sighed in relief as Cheerilee stepped into the little circle of light. Oh, Teach, I hit my head and I don't know where, where we are, so could you please? She begged, nodding her head towards the ropes. Her white skin grew even paler than usual when she realized Cheerilee was carrying a hammer in her mouth. She didn't know why that freaked her out all of a sudden, but there was something in Cheerilee's eyes. Uh, miss? She squeaked weakly. Cheer's only response was to lift up one of her hooks, revealing her to be wearing another one of those special work pony's shoes. Not unlike, not unlike the one she used, used to hold the chisel. This one had a, had a far smaller hole though, and the, and the circle wasn't completely closed off. It was designed to hold nails. Well, while still being able to s slip the shoe off the nail through the opening once the job is almost done. Where are you, Sweetie Belle began, but she was, but she cut herself off with a scream as truly left, let her action speak for, for her, hammering the a nail di diagonally into the filly's right hoof and through her heel until it got stuck into the wooden table below her. She felt a trickle of warm blood coat, coat the nail and, and by her, and bit her lip as she struggled to keep calm, but she knew simply attempting attempting to to pull her hoof away now would would cause even more damage and more in, importantly pain. Not that the the ropes currently offered her much freedom of movement, but she didn't she didn't want to take any risk. With tears in her eyes, she started pleading with Chi Lee again, completely bewildered by the by this recent chain of events. Her mind racing to figure out, figure out what was going on, how she, how she could wake up from this nightmare. But please stop! What have I? The Philly, the Philly whimpered. Julie just smiled sweetly, sweetly as best as she could with the hammer between her teeth as she prepared another nail. This time, putting it in place against against the Philly's other hind hoof. The mare looked, looked Sweetie Belle in the eyes intently for a moment, making sure she knew exactly what was coming for her. Sweetie Belle whimpered and swallowed back a new burst of tears before crying out, No! Help! Sis! Rarity! Any pony! But no pony replied, let alone came, came to a rescue as Cheerilee's hammered down for the, for the second time, driving the, driving the nail through the filly's left hoof and, and into the table with just a few willing blows. Sweetie Belle squeaked in pain as she tried tried her best to keep still. The necessity of remaining still weighing down 
upon her as heavily as as the pain itself. She kind of understood the concept behind walking it off a lot better now, as she and she have given anything to be able to, to do just that. She saw this cheerily duck down to retrieve another nail, walking her walking around to the other side of the table. No, please, no. The white. The white-coated filly sobbed, letting out a desperate cry as Cheerilee started nailing one of, one of her front legs down, before quickly doing the same with the, with the with the other one as well. Sweetie Belle could feel pain radiating through each, through each one of her legs, but, but for her tormentor, it still wasn't enough. Unaffected by the filly's crying and pleading, she continued, she continued on and drove drove a second nail through each of the filly's. Philly's legs, this time straight through the ankle just above the hooves themselves. Little pools of blood started to form, form around her hooves, flowing off the edge of the hammer and dripping down down to the ground lazily. In the heat of the moment, Shirley dropped dropped the hammer and tentatively held her held her tongue underneath one of the little streams, savoring the taste of Sweetie Belle's warm blood as it dripped on dripped into her mouth. It tasted even better than Scootaloo's had, probably because it had and hadn't had as much time to cool down yet. The filly was still crying softly as Cheerley rummaged, rummaged about retrieving one of the several matches she had she had stored in the room. She she struck it against the nearby wall and bowed, bowed her head down to to light a fire underneath the underneath the metal cylinder cylinder that reached up from just above the the floor to the to the table itself. Connecting to the table in the spot where Sweetie Belle had felt the hole in the wood earlier. The little bits of wood and tinder the, the mare had, had prepared for this, this occasion quickly caught, caught a fire quickly as it continued burning nicely. Smoke circling, circling up to hang just underneath the ceiling. Cheerily looked, looked up at it, but wasn't too worried. The room was badly ventilated, but it was a small fire and she wouldn't need needed that much longer in any case. A minute or two passed, Cheerly Cheerly just mesmerized by the small flames as she waited, thinking thinking of the fun she had with snails earlier. The white filly slowly stopped crying, sniffling pathetically as she looked at Cheerly with tear, teary eyes, confused with by the mayor's actions. But hopefully that this pause meant she was reconsidering keeping her keeping there against her will. Please, miss, if you l let me go, I won't tell, tell any pony. I promise. She managed to say with trembling, trembling lip, but again, truly neglected to respond. Suddenly, Sweetie Belle became aware of a panicked squeaking noise coming from, from somewhere in the room. The sound increased with intensity steadily until it, until it sounded like, sounded like a, a great many rats were fearing for their life somewhere. Even though that didn't seem to make any sense, she had some some trouble locating the source of the noise until she suddenly realized it came from right underneath the table, from the from the thing truly was starting starting at, but she could not see. As her teacher as her teacher stepped closer to the to the table, she mentally recoiled, but the mayor simply leaned leaned in and reached underneath the table itself. Grabbing, grabbing hold of a metal plate on the on the top of the cylinder with her teeth and pulling pulling it out, removing the last barrier between the cylinder and the hole underneath Sweetie Belle in doing so. The squeaking escalated quickly escalated to unprecedented levels, but still Sweetie Belle couldn't make, make head nor tail of it. What did rats have to do with a metal plate? Uh oh. Suddenly the 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 filly gasped as her eyes grew wide as fierce as she felt dozens of little Little claws scratching at her, scratching at her back as the as the trapped rats searched up from the overheated cylinder to find to find a way to escape the flames. Even in their frenzied state, they recognized the difference, the differences between the difference between harness and their between their metal prison and their and the filly's tender flesh, and they are fully prepared to put some effort into creating a way to a way out of it meant living to squeak another day. Many mouths and claws worked, worked together as they started to gnaw and tear at the filly's back, her, her terrified screams of pain not managing to extract any mercy from the from the swarm of vermin. She tried arching up her back to lift, to lift it out of their reach. 
which, which would also have set them free, but with their but with their bodies stretched to its limit and held held firmly in place by the by the rope and nails, she can even lift lift it a tenth of an inch. The rats quickly ripped away patches of her coat and skin, relent relentlessly going on to nod or flush. The filly screamed as she thrashed her head about from side to side, unable to do anything else as the rats started to devour her alive, piece by piece. Like a well-oiled digging, digging implement, they ripped, through, they ripped and tugged at her muscles and, and ligaments, tearing out sinews and arteries, both, both as they pushed onward. Several of them came face to face with her spine, but but decided to simply gnaw around it when it when it proved to be proved to be a nut too hard to crack. After all, they were they were aiming to break free and didn't didn't have a have a bone to pick with any of any of the elements they made, that made up Sweetie's body in particular. The filly herself shrieked like a banshee, foam appearing appearing on her on her mouth as her muscles convulsed and her and her body thrashed about as much as it could, which is which is to say not much at all. Regardless of what she still moved enough enough for the nails to pull to pull at the at the wounds that had inflicted on her, causing the causing the holes to become larger and bleed even more profusely. But this, although painful, was was only at least only the least of her troubles as the rat's combined efforts finally broke through the layers of skin and muscle and, and erupt and they erupted into her abdominal cavity, clawing up Past her, past her intestines, or in some cases, simply gnawing through. The unpleasant and torturous feeling soon, soon turned sweetie green and, with nausea, and her stomach buckled as she vomited, partially, partially managing to spray it next to her on the table, but some of it getting onto herself as she could only breathe, barely lift, lift her, lift her head to aim it, aim it away. The ensuing screams, screams of music to cheer his ears. And when copious amounts of blood started streaming out at the bottom of the metal cylinder, falling down into the fire where it hissed, her legs got all wobbly with excitement. As the rats continued to bite and claw their way through Sweetie Belle, her, her screaming slowly shifted to a wet gurgling noise. At every passing second, more of her internal organs got ripped to shreds as the disoriented rats tried to find a way out. A few of them stayed right on target as they started started advancing on the upper part of the filly's abdomen, opposite to the point where it had entered. Some of the other rats were were clueless through as they kept going around in circles or started off in completely wrong ways, digging horizontal tunnels of gore through Sweetie Bell. As one of the rats tore through her diaphragm, the filly's breathing became shallow and troubled, and and truly. And truly started taking up bets with with herself as to what would kill the filly first: loss of blood or the inevitable destruction of some vital organ and, or the other. It was all. It wasn't long after that the that the filly's stomach began, started to bulge out before suddenly a, a blood-soaked rat tore away tore away the last the last patch of skin with its sharp claws and poked its head out of her stomach. The truly the small. The small furry critter was is the most adorable thing she had seen in quite some time, especially the way it looked around the room with curious eyes. And it, it clawed its it clawed its way fully out of Sweetie Belle's warm entrails and made its way way down her quivering body and off the table. She soon followed by a dozen of his of his brethren as they as they all fled their meaty their meaty container and scurried scurried off into the darkness. The pale filly's body convulsed so wildly with was shocked that not even not even the ropes were enough to hold her down down anymore. She thrashed and shook against the, her bindings as a stream of blood flowed out of her mouth and down and down her chin. Nails ripping through her flesh were simply getting pulled out of the table altogether. After a few violent seconds, during which most of the rats escaped, all the nails had ripped either through her flesh or her hoof or both. But the filly was already too far gone to notice or care. Her body convulsed one, la one last time as she let out a horrifying, horrifying choking sound, and then the filly finally passed away. In the ensuing silence, the only thing was that could still be heard was the dripping of blood and Truly's heavy panting. 
Since the blood flowing out of the cylinder had long since extinguished the, clock, the crackling flames the mayor had, had lit earlier, a few moments passed during which Cheerly tried to control the trembling of her, of her body until suddenly a soft squeaking noise could be heard. The reason for Sweetie's choking sounds toward the end became, became apparent once, once as her mouth opened, one of the rats forcing his way out of her, her throat and climbing past her teeth to freedom. Cheerly burst, in, burst out went at once into hysterical laughter, still in the throes of hilarity when she took took the, the stairs back up and get and get to the Phillies, Phillies and Colts dressing area. All the way up, there 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 only one question on her mind. Why had no comedian ever thought of this before? Death is simply hysterical. Damn. Since I've been here for that, that is royally fucked up. <laughs> <coughs> well, well, it did sound like like it could could have been from one of the Saw movies, but but I guess that was actually pretty creative. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I might have to do do part five later on, and uh, hopefully release it on Halloween Day, maybe. Well, well, at least I'll I get to release release this on Nevada Day, so. So. Anyways. Yeah, that's it. At least Audacity didn't fuck up. Well, anyways, this is... This is Gunnar Stauffer, Gim Rollins, Gim Rollins 201, saying... Happy, ne Happy Nevada Day. And...